Hey there students, thanks for joining me for another edition of me reading the Hope Chest. In today's reading, uh, Violet is going to be sent to a telegraph office to send a uh, telegram back to her parents in Susquehanna, Pennsylvania. So uh, this is a picture of what a telegraph office would have looked like about a hundred years ago. Uh, bef back then there was no, um, you know, like houses didn't have telephones. Uh, you know, obviously like, you know, cell phones and the internet didn't exist yet. And so if you needed to communicate with somebody over a long distance, you had two choices. You could write them a letter and mail it, which would take, you know, days or weeks to get there, or you could send a telegram. And so what a telegram was is they would use Morse code, which was a series of dots and dashes that stood for individual letters to make words. And you would go to a telegram office and then you could send a telegram to wherever you wanted to go and then then they would deliver it to that person. Um, so it's kind of like going into a building and then telling someone what you want the message to say and then them texting it for you would kind of be like an analogy that would work now. Uh, but back then, because someone had to manually do, you know, type in every single letter and send it over a wire, they would charge you for every uh, word, either by letter or by word. So they would charge you. So the longer a message you had, the more it would cost. And so it it was cheaper to make a short and uh, just a nice short message. So uh, I'm reading in chapter seven, heading to Nashville. An alarming sight greeted Violet and Myrtle when they came down to breakfast in the morning. Mr. Martin, whom they, whom they had left at the settlement house in New York, was quietly sipping coffee at the kitchen table with his hat in his hand. Miss Dexter was at the table, too. They both turned to look at Violet and Myrtle. Good morning, said Miss Dexter. She said it with a somewhat martyred air. She pushed a plate of toast towards the girls. The coffee's on the stove. Good morning, said Mr. Martin. Good morning, Mr. Martin, said Vo Violet awkwardly. She thought that once they'd gotten away from Mr. Martin and his awkward questions about parents at the Henry Street Settlement House, that would be the end of him. But he would actually come after them, that he would actually come after them hadn't occurred to her. You followed us here, sir, said Myrtle. Not exactly, said Mr. Martin. I came here to make sure you were still in one piece, yes. But I took the train from Penn Station. I'm not really sure how you got here. We hopped two freights in a blind, said Myrtle matter-of-factly. Violet looked down at her shoes, expecting to be scolded. It was her usual lot in life. But if Mr. Martin thought he was going to make her go home to Susquehanna, he could think again. Mr. Martin raised an eyebrow. That's very dangerous, you know. Accidents happen to people jumping freight trains. I've seen people who've lost arms and legs. Against her will, Violet found herself looking at Mr. Martin's hand with the missing fingers. She would have liked to have asked what had happened to them, but such a question was unthinkable. And what about your families, Mr. Martin went on. Did you tell them where you are? I don't have a family, said Myrtle. Mr. Martin turned his raised eyebrow on Myrtle, and Violet felt she needed to back her up. It's true, Mr. Martin. She doesn't. And what about your parents, Miss Mayhew, Mr. Martin said. I think they must be frantic by now, don't you? No, said Violet. They only care about my brother, Stephen. They don't think girls are good for much. They are your parents, said Mr. Martin. It doesn't matter whether you're a boy or a girl, they'll be worried. As soon as you've, as soon as you've eaten, we will go out and send them a telegram. I'm not going back, said Violet, starting to panic. I want to go to Tennessee. I want to see Chloe. She'd plan on joining the ladies who were going to meet, who were going to Tennessee, if they would let her. Please sit down and eat, Violet, Miss Dexter pleaded. The way she said it made Violet realize that she might be causing a scene, and so she immediately sat down and did as she was told. Myrtle sat down and reached for a piece of toast. She spread it with strawberry jam. Don't you want to go to Tennessee, sir? Unaccountably, Mr. Martin looked embarrassed again. Why would I want to go to Tennessee, Miss Davies? Because history is going to be made, Miss Dexter said enthusiastically. Two pink spots stood out on her cheeks. I'm going. I wouldn't miss it for the world. If Tennessee becomes the 36th state to ratify the Susan B. Anthony Amendment and women get the vote, won't that be something to say you were there and saw it? Yes, said Myrtle. I'd like to go too, said Violet. She wasn't a suffragist, but Chloe was in Tennessee. Well, so would I. Mr. Martin admitted. He frowned at Violet, but we're still going to wire your parents as soon as you're done eating. Violet stared at him, unsure of what he meant. He couldn't possibly mean that he was going to let Violet and Myrtle go to Tennessee, and in fact go with them. It's my duty, anyway, to see that you get there safely, Mr. Martin added. He sounded like he was talking himself into something. Miss Burns swept into the kitchen, her red hair glowing in the morning light. Miss Dexter introduced her. So you're the Mr. Martin we've heard so much about, said Miss Burns. Mr. Martin looked down at his coffee, coloring. 
Nothing too bad, I hope. Very little at all bad, said Miss Burns, amused. I understand you taught Chloe to patch automobile tires. Violet looked at Mr. Martin in surprise. She remembered that from Chloe's letters. And now he wants to go off to Tennessee, said Miss Dexter, along with... She frowned at Myrtle again. Well, we have space on the train, said Miss Burns. Why shouldn't they go and see history being made and see a suffragist, she added, looking shrewdly at Mr. Martin. The telegraph office was three blocks down Pennsylvania Avenue. It had a strange smell of ink, old wood, and electricity. Mr. Martin got Violet a form. Violet stared at it, nibbling at the on the end of her fountain pen, on the fountain pen chained to the desk. Myrtle tried to look over her shoulder, but the desk was too high for her to see. Mr. Martin wanted to make Myrtle send a telegram, too, but she was adamant that she had no one to send it to. Violet didn't tell Mr. Martin about the Girls' Training Institute, of course. That was Myrtle's business. You had to pay for a telegraph by the word, and a great deal, though Violet wasn't sure exactly how much. It was much cheaper than a long-distance phone call, which, was only, which only very rich people could afford to make, but it was still expensive. Now, what could she write without letting her parents know where to find her? She dipped the pen into the inkwell set in the desk. I am fine, she wrote, printing each world carefully on the form. Then she saw a way to save a few cents and crossed out I am and wrote I'm. She tried to think of something else to say. How are you? But that was the sort of thing you wrote in a letter when you weren't paying for every single word. Well, that won't break the bank, Mr. Martin said, looking over his shoulder. But you can't use any punctuation marks, so contractions like I'm are out. And up to the first ten words, it's all the same price, 40 cents. Violet dipped the pen in ink again, crossed out what she'd written, and started over. Mother and father, I am fine. That was six words. She didn't want to tell them she was going to Tennessee. What if they notified the police to arrest her there? For the same reason, she couldn't mention women's suffrage. She had four words left. Hope you are too. You'd better sign it, Mr. Martin suggested. The signature is free. Violet wrote her first name. You're a woman of few words, said Mr. Martin. He took the form up to the counter, dropped a 50-cent piece on it, and slid it under the brass bars to the clerk. I can pay for it, said Violet. She still had 42 cents left. Allow me. It was my idea, after all, Mr. Martin smiled. There's nothing wrong with going off to have adventures, you know, as long as you let your folks know you're all right. This was not something Violet had heard a grown-up suggest before. You must have a lot of adventures, she said. You must have a lot of adventures, she said, and then winced at her forwardness. He touched his scar and smiled again. Yes, a great many. When I was your age, I walked from Pennsylvania to Long Island with Mother Jones on her children's crusade. But my parents knew I was going. What was the children's crusade? Myrtle asked as they went out to the broad, busy street. A March Mother Jones, she's a labor organizer, a remarkable old lady, put together to draw attention to child labor. She took a bunch of us kids from the mines and the mills, especially those of us with something to show for our work. He held up his hand with the missing fingers. She got all our parents' permission, and we were all outfitted with a tin plate and a spoon. We walked up through Pennsylvania to New York and then out to Oyster Bay, Long Island, to call on President Roosevelt. What did President Roosevelt say? Violet asked as they stopped to let a large open-sided sightseeing bus shaped like an overgrown rowboat pass. He wouldn't see us, said Mr. Martin. So we walked back again. Then it didn't do any good, said Myrtle. Sure it did, Mr. Martin said. We got out of the mills for weeks. We had a lot of fun on that walk, playing and running around like other kids, sleeping in barns and eating what folks along the road gave to us. Mother Jones and her helpers taught us to read, too. But President Roosevelt wouldn't see you, Violet reminded him. No, but thousands of people did see us. You can never know what seeds your words and actions might plant. We may get children out of the mines and mills in this country yet. It's only been 17 years since our march. He smiled wryly. Even, though, even when you don't win, you don't always lose. Remember that. Yes, Mr. Martin, said Violet politely. It's a shame a woman like Mother Jones can't vote to change the child labor laws. Mother Jones doesn't want to vote. She's an anti. Violet looked at him to see if he was joking. Doesn't want to vote? Why not? That, said Mr. Martin, is a mystery. Alrighty, have a fantastic spring break. Thank you for listening.